there, and welcome to Star Wars Music Minute, where we celebrate the music and sound of Star Wars five cinematic minutes at a time. I'm Chrysanthi Tan, you can call me Xanthi, and today we are diving deep into the soundscapes contained within minutes 36 through 40 of Star Wars Episode 4, A New Hope, also known as the motion picture. This corresponds to the time code 0 hours 3501 until 40. Zero, zero. And in this excerpt of the film, we finally hear Princess Leia's entire message. Ben tells Luke that he must learn to use the Force. Then Vader does use the Force to choke Admiral Mahdi. And then we go back to Tatooine where Luke, Ben, and 3PO and R2 see the remains of a pretty terrible looking attack on a sand crawler. And this clip ends with Luke running to his speeder, realizing that his own home and aunt and uncle must be in trouble. Today's guest is composer, oboist, brilliant thinker, Elizabeth Lane. Hello, Elizabeth. Hey, everyone. I'm oh, really, my God. I'm really excited <laughs> to have you. I, I see, am so stoked. For those listening on the podcast, um, she has this, like, you can see her synthesis, like her modular synth in the background. It's, there's like a lot of wires sticking out. It's very, yeah, it's very, that's like a, that's a total music producer flex right there. I mean, I had to do <laughs> but it. You have it and you made it. So like, why not? It's so and, much you, fun. and you use it. Yeah. It's not like you bought it as a wall piece or something. Um, <laughs> so that's cool. Um, well, how do you, how do you feel about the, the music and the sound overall in the scene? Oh gosh. Um, I, I, when I first saw it, I was like, Oh my God, such an iconic scene or set of scenes. And then I kind of realized that you could pretty much pick any five minutes of a new hope and they would be iconic scenes. And what really strikes me kind of the overall sense I got, and I've thought about this from a script point of view too, but, uh, sonically how lean a new hope is. And I know George Lucas just started like trimming and trimming everything down that wasn't kind of core to the story, core to the adventure. And Marshall and, Lucas. Yeah. And it's just like super, super, like just there's no uh, uh, access to it at all. Everything is very, very to the point. And I, and I love that. And the sound and the music is all very focused as well. And uh, such, such a wonderful scene. And or set of scenes, I guess. And it just, I like the choices too in the music a lot. Then we'll talk about those. Uh, Cause there's some really interesting choices that I feel mm. if done in a more modern context, Ooh, uh, would then have we can been different. Speculate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That'll, be, that'll be fun to speculate um, how things might have been different in a modern context. And I think it, this is a really good, um, I think a new hope in particular is a really good case study for, for that you know there are a few um you know film it's not like um everything changed overnight it was sort of like you know things evolve and a new hope re represented a turning point in so many industries that it is a really um like emblematic symbol of its time mm -hmm. and yeah i think it'll be really interesting um to talk about that so Usually, um, well, we go chronologically and, you know, I'll, I'll kind of guide us through the, the different scenes and stuff. And then we'll talk about the things we hear along the way. Does that sound good to you? Perfect. Sweet. Um, first, I want to say a random stat is that um, this scene has the second biggest dialogue word count in all of the five minute chunks interesting at least in the way that like i have organized them you know it, just five minutes at a time because basically i went through like like i have this very intense like note-taking system and so basically like i have the whole like i have all the dialogue already like i have the whole script in my notes and it's separated by five minutes so that when it's time to like record the next episode i have just that chunk of the script to refer to and then I like have word counts for all of them. And so I was just looking, comparing the word counts and this is, yeah, this is, this is the second most. And the first most is, um, was kind of from the same 
It, it was uh, two episodes ago, or three episodes ago, ago. It was the episode with Aiden Feltkamp um, with Hologram Opera. And that was also Ben and Luke talking in, you know, talking about mm-hmm. Princess Leia and everything. So this whole... I guess what I'm saying is like, even though this is like 10 minutes or 15 minutes later, it still is like kind of part of the same part of the story, which is the exposition about the rebels and learning more about Ben and, you know, just getting their relationship off to a start. And I guess that's, it it just, um, concretely, like it was interesting to see, like that's the bulk of like where the dialogue exposition is. Hmm. Cause that's where Luke has to like, go from being a moisture farmer to to seeing this future of like oh wait am i gonna go to alderaan and learn the force like and right there's this princess and ben is obi-wan and he knew my father and there's the clone wars and oh my gosh like there's so much that happens yeah for sure and and that's something that i found really fascinating about it is because like it's so so pivotal to luke's you know kind of the inciting incident that brings him into the adventure yeah. So we start inside of Ben Kenobi's dwelling. And the first thing we hear actually is like radio static. <laughs> like he's trying to find a signal and it's sort of like changing channels and then it goes clear. Um, so Ben is continuing a, a line that he started in the previous set of minutes. And he's like, you know, got to find out where you come from. I saw a part of the message he was and then it seems that he found it, found it and says, I seem to have found it. And that's when we get. Leia's theme. Well, Leia actually starts talking and says, General Kenobi, years ago, you served my father in the Clone Wars. And, and that's actually technically like where the melody starts. Now he begs you to help him in his struggle against the Empire. I regret that I'm. I am unable to present my father's request to you in person, but my ship has fallen under attack, and I am afraid my mission to bring you to Alderaan has failed. I have placed information vital to the survival of the rebellion into the memory systems of this R2 unit. My father will know how to retrieve it. You must see this droid safely delivered to him on Alderaan. This is our most desperate hour. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. Like, reading it, it sounds much longer than it feels when she says it (laughs) because of the music. (laughs) Yeah. So the music is really interesting here. Um, it starts out with just a very, very low, like low level of strings, just kind of in the background playing some chords. And then Leia's theme over it is uh, oboe and a uh, lovely solo oboe, which of course as an oboist, I'm just good choice. Good choice, John Williams. Um, and, and I love what that brings to this scene. Uh, So I thought it was an English horn. How can you tell the difference? Um, The main difference between an English horn and an oboe is that an oboe is just pitched higher. English horn is tuned a fifth lower. So you can kind of think of it like a violin versus a viola. Um, They're pretty much identical otherwise. Uh, Also, if you're looking at them, the English horn has kind of a bulb on the bottom. Uh, but sonically it's just pitched higher. And also because of kind of the range of it, English horn has a much uh, more resonant reedy sound to it uh, throughout English most horn? of its range. English horn. Yeah. Interesting. I always feel like oboe sounds more reedy, but I guess it depends on what reedy means. Like oboe yeah, sounds more uh, duck, like a duck. Yeah. It's got the kind of more quack like quality. I don't know. Uh, but like when you get up into the upper ranges of oboe, it's a much more pure sound. It kind of hits closer to a flute sound. So really, um, whereas I, I always feel like when you get a into the higher range of an English horn, it sounds a little more strained, whereas the oboe can really sing in a higher range. Um, and yeah, I mean, they're both beautiful solo instruments. So uh, and, and John and Williams uses lovely. them both for Leia as well as flutes. Mm-hmm. I mean, he goes through a lot of different orchestrations of Leia's yeah. theme for sure. And I, I thought here, like, too, it, it it feels like the kind of two choices for instruments would have been oboe or flute. 
uh, for Leia's theme here, at, at, and at least in the solo, because as it gets on a little bit further, it kind of comes in with a woodwind section playing the melody about halfway through Leia's exposition. Uh, Oboe, kind of historically, and this is why I really, really like it paired with the visuals, is uh, as, as a solo instrument, it's used a lot for themes of, of love, of longing, kind of that wistfulness. Um, it it kind of has those qualities to it. And if you look, like, during the scene, Luke is, and, and Obi-Wan, too, are, are kind of just looking and unlongingly, and Luke is like, who is this person? And I feel like that pairing of, of the oboe and, you know, and, and we kind of know where it goes with the, the relationship that eventually develops with Luke and Leia uh, as things go on throughout the, the series. But uh, I, I find oboe just to be a really, really good choice kind of with what it has historically been used for. Um, yeah. And I think it's interesting, or for me, <laughs> I tend to think of things in terms of how far you wait until you bring in the strings. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, because the strings, in addition to being the best instrument, you know, obviously the best part of the orchestra, clearly. I'm kidding. I'm, I'm totally kidding. Uh, but the strings are the biggest. And so they provide the most like right. bodies of sound or, you know what I mean? They, they're the most mm-hmm. like there's dozens, dozens of string yeah. players. So to bring in like the string section is sort of like bringing in the army or like, mm-hmm. you know, bringing in a, a big, a big section. And it's also like the solo versus section um, aspect yeah. of it. And here is like very soloistic. Like here's a definitely solo solo spot right and that really really brings this singular and like even just like the kind of the hologram of leia being physically small and sort of insubstantial it really it it, with the solo it kind of to me i think of it like focusing in on this Mm -hmm. on this moment and of course then it's mostly exposition but it's such an important moment and then, of course, as like the themes of what Lay is talking about, like this is a big deal, we're under attack, you know, then the woodwind section comes in, uh, which I also find an interesting choice because it keeps it this tender theme. Right. Which it could have been they like you could have brass. gotten more, in- yeah, brass, a more intense feel, get kind of motion in the strings, but it stays tender. It stays this very heartfelt moment. And I love that choice. Uh, because Williams knows we can get to those intense moments later. This needs to just kind of sit. That's such a good point because if it sort of represents, like I think Leia's theme here is like, I kind of call it like the lovesick Luke theme as well. And because this is Leia through Luke's eyes and you know what you're saying with about the oboe and the historical use of the oboe for love themes and, and, and such corroborates with, my theory or what I'm thinking about and (laughs) Luke's tie in to joining this whole mission isn't like it's, it's some emotional longing part. So like Luke is associated with Leia's theme here and, and also the force theme. It's like both of those very tender sort of like looking to something else basically besides living on the homestead. It just yes. out toward the future. It's not Luke with like snares and a an, uh, military march behind him being like, I can't wait to serve my country or, or you know, whatever, <laughs> yeah. or whatever. It's like an afterthought. He's like, I don't like the empire. He's like, I hate the empire too. But really it's like his heart is guiding him toward something, mm-hmm. toward the sunsets. Uh, another thing that I also find really interesting in, I associate oboe and English horn a lot with kind of a royalty sound more than yeah. like flute, which is a little more naturalistic in my kind of where I place instruments in my composer brain. Uh, and of course, Leia being a princess, like I feel like it fits really, really well with that. And it didn't really like, you know, again, like looking at these things so specifically in this five minute chunk, I never really thought of it that way before, but I'm like, wait a minute. That could yeah. be a thing here. And yep. I just, and I, whether or not Williams thought it that way or not, I just think that it fits really well. And I think the solo nature of it, again, fits that because 
it's sort of like special. It's like a theme. It's like, I don't know. Mm-hmm. For some reason, that is that feels significant to me. But I, what you're saying about the horns is funny because we were um, kind of talking about that a little bit on the last episode. Um, and something else that you're saying in um, Element 7, who was from episode two of this season on this podcast, who um, is not does not come from a music background, but he had this like really great observation about how the music seems to kind of fit the size of the scene. And um, yeah, just something that you were saying about like the small, the the small little hologram reminds reminds me of that. Well, and then of course you have like Leia, like a singular person, like, putting this message into the R2 unit, sending him off, hoping like, it's kind of like that message in a bottle, uh, you know, help me, Omi one, you're my only hope, like, oh my God. And then as she talks about, you need to bring this, it's vital to the rebellion, as then the woodwind sections come and the strings start to come in more, now you get more people. So it goes from being this singular person trying to save the empire in this like one moment to more of a group, the rebellion, Come with me, Obi Wan. You know, like it's sort of a bringing in of the people into the rebellion. Oh, that's so cool! That's like a it's like a grassroots building of like their themes, really. And it um, happens within what like thirty seconds. It's ridiculous, but like again, this is what I mean about how the music is so efficient too. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Because when I think about like the Empire, it's like they can turn on at the I'm bad at euphemisms. I should have thought at the click of a button, at the turn of a sw- at the click of a. <laughs> Do you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> like just immediately, like- they can just turn on and be like immediate military, like military. The the whole battery is out. Like it's right. like a fully fledged like, and and it's not. And their themes don't necessarily grow and like develop. Right. And from like a Ten solo speed. instrument to like a, something else. Entire it's, horn section hits at once. Yeah. Right? It's just like deploy the theme or it's like deploy the empire stuff and mm-hmm. all of this force rebel stuff, you know, the hero stuff. It comes from a much more r- ragtag building, show your work to kind of way. Yeah, absolutely. It's awesome. Um, and then, like, moving on from that, we see, like, basically the next 15 seconds is just reaction shots of Luke and Obi-Wan. And there's no dialogue. So you go from this huge exposition dump to nothing where we just let it sit. And I think that, and, and there's no, like, music, really, just a little bit of, like, maybe a twinkle in the background. And yeah, it's like, it just, like, we fades just know- out. <laughs> yeah, you're like, we just need to let this moment sit for both the characters to absorb it and the audience to absorb it. And I think also a great, great choices all around for the sound design on that to just let it sit for 15 seconds is like a lifetime in movie length. I feel like um, Obi-Wan is very mischievous. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, I feel like it's like he's almost testing Luke. Like, so what are you going to do about this? Uh What do you think? (laughs) Right. Well, and there's also like, he knows who Luke and Leia are. Like, he knows so much. And yet, like, he's not saying it. And of course, the audience doesn't know it either. But there's like, it. you can tell in, in his face, he knows a lot. He's testing. He's like, what do you think, Luke? And he's like, yeah, you're all in trouble. Are you gonna? Are you gonna step up? Mm hmm. It's there's so much happening here. Um, I wrote in my notes. Well, first of all, the um, like original script that um, says old Ben leans back and scratches his head. He silently puffs on a tarnished chrome water pipe, which I didn't actually see in this scene. So I don't I, maybe that didn't make it in there. <laughs> or, no, I don't think it's. Or I don't know what a water pipe looks like. But he does like stroke his beard and do, does like <laughs> lean back. Um, and it says Luke has stars in his eyes, um, which is funny. But. And the music, the way that the music fades out and also like the transmission sort of like the static kind of fades out mm-hmm. and, and like the music fades out with like the harp kind of like <laughs> plucking. Um, it's like, was this a dream or something? Uh, it's, I think it's just really funny how it's mixed there. 
Uh, yeah, I think I wrote twinkly in like in my notes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and then Ben says, just like seemingly out of nowhere, you must learn the ways of the forest if you're to come with me to Alderan. <laughs> And um, first of all, love how he's just so committed to the way he pronounces things and how it, it just, it's beautiful. Alderan. Um, here I wrote, like, is Obi-Wan trying to mind trick Luke here? Like, it's like Luke never said he was going to go to Alderaan, but he's like, but Ben's already moved to the next step. You must right. learn the ways of the forest if you're to come with me to Alderaan. Like, clearly, I mean, it's, I know this message was meant for me, but you're coming too. It's, it's like so like, many steps are skipped, and it's, he's so mischievous. Luke's like, Alderaan, I'm not going to Alderaan. I've got to get home. It's late. I'm in for it as it is. And I'm like, I don't, well, I, I don't actually think Obi Wan was trying to, um, force or like mind trick luke but if he had been i would say luke passed his first um his first mind tricking because he's like I, was it yeah he could have been like interpretation yes i am going to alter like yeah <laughs> i i think it's so cool like we have that right and it's just it, i know there's been some criticisms of a new hope for just you know sometimes things are just like wait what kind of out of nowhere like yes you have to learn the force it's like this thing i just heard about wonderful like eh, it's kind of funny but it gets right to it and and again because we're here for lightsabers we're here for space battles we're here for the adventure of it but also Um, how is that like any more out of place first of all ben on tatooine is already kind of like a weird like he already kind of doesn't fit in he's already mm -hmm. seen as like a weird hermit so like first like how would anything anything of this sort be out of character for him and mm-hmm. also, how is it any different from like, <laughs> I get pamphlets like at least every few months where people are like giving me some like Christian pamphlet of yeah. of saving myself or like, you know, just people on the sh- like, I mean, I, I live in a big city. So like this just happens a lot and <laughs> where, you know, there's always yeah. people that are kind of like, try my mystical thing or like, mm-hmm. don't you you need to learn the force or like, don't you want to be saved or something? Um, <laughs> yeah. I like the fact that you have, you need to learn the force pamphlets handed to you. Uh, that sounds wonderful. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, if you want to come to Alderaan slash heaven. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh. I love it. But you know, again, like Obi-Wan does kind of know. And like, I feel, I, I always feel it's like, well, he knows the relationship between Luke and Leia. He knows that, obviously Luke's father. Um, So it makes sense to kind of like, okay, I I get the sense that Obi-Wan was just waiting for Luke's call to call to action. And so he's like, yeah, Yeah. this is it. I recognized it. Yep. Yep. It's, it's the call to action. And here he's like, no. Um, Yeah. And Ben's like, like, (laughs) right after we have the refusal of the call, like if you're looking at sort of hero's hero's journey. journey, um which uh brings in sort of the next music cue uh yes. which is delightful where well first he uh, says i need your help luke she needs your help <laughs> i'm getting too old for this thing and then dark and ominous not um, not necessarily ominous it's dark though it's, and i believe it's strings right uh yep. a string section um and it's just it's a great because it's total refusal to call uh luke says something like i can't get involved what good would i be uh this total total turning away from it and and i love it it's just a very again efficient use of use of the music to set the tone there uh, Luke doubting himself, doubting that he has anything to offer. Yeah, he says, I can't get involved. I got work to do. It's not like I like the Empire. I hate it, but there's nothing I can do about it right now. It's all such a long way from here. Mm-hmm. So this theme, or I don't know what to call it, this little cue, 
really stands out in my mind and there are many references to it in my brain that I can't totally place. Well, one of them is that it seems it seems like a hidden like DSRA. Hmm. Anyway, I mean, it is literally those yeah. notes, but like, I think it then actually next episode next week will be like a deep dive on the, on DSE, right? But, um, that is, that's always been one of those things where it's like, does that count? Does it not? Like how lenient are we being with how we, um, categorize these things or like whether we say it's like a true sighting or like if it even matters, but okay. It is those four, those four notes are in there, whatever you make of it. Mm-hmm. And we get those four notes really big, like the classic A New Hope DSRA part comes in the next set of minutes, which is why we're talking about the next week. But um, the DSRA does come like very soon yeah. after this. And so it's possible that that's hidden there. And I'll also no- I'll also mention that 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 Jin's theme from Rogue One mm-hmm. has um, sounds very is also based on the DSRA or like, I don't, I don't, I don't want to say based on, but contains that those building blocks. So Jin's theme goes. Um, but anyway, it starts in the same sort of. Um, hmm. in that same like rhythmic pattern. So like, yeah, I, I have, I actually in, in researching this, I was like, where, why is this so familiar? And I did find a video on YouTube that was like hidden or like rogue one Jin's theme was to te- like basically telegraphed in a new hope, this theme, this part and whether or not like Michael Giacchino did that on purpose to recall this tiny little cue in a new hope. I mean, maybe, but what I think is actually connecting them is the DSERA is, yeah. you know, they're both variations on DSERA. So, well, and that makes sense too, with what's coming. Like you said, the foreshadowing to next, next episode. Yeah. Uh, but I also like how, you know, he's talking about how it's too, it's so far away. And just before that we had this, you know, Luke looking at the hologram of Leia and this sort of longing feeling. So we've get this sort of distance, this longing, this thing outside of yourself, this call to adventure. It's all very compact musically and, and sort of textually. The hologram really is such a like brilliant metaphor for something that is really far away, but seems like so close you can touch it. <laughs> like mm-hmm. it's far, but it's, but it's close. And this was before the internet. Right. So, <laughs> um, yeah, it is interesting how like actually far away Leia is, but um, they've been staring at her hologram and listening to it for like, I don't know, however long they've been trying to get it to work an hour. <laughs> I don't know. Five minutes. Who knows? Um, but yeah, all these things are like so out of reach for Luke on the outer rim until he takes the call eventually. OK, so. Oh, yeah. So then Ben's like. Oh, sorry. Ben says, that's your uncle talking. Luke says, my uncle, how am I ever going to explain this? Ben says, learn about the force, Luke. <laughs> and right on cue. It's so, yep. That was like string, supposed to be string tremolos. Um, yeah. <laughs> I almost snorted when I heard it because right as soon as he says, yeah, learn the force, it's like force theme. And, yeah. you know, we all know that John Williams is great at using theme and it's like, really, that's really on the nose, but it's just so good. Yeah. Um, also, maybe it wasn't as on the, or it, I think it is, it's hard to like put it in the context of watching it for the first time right. then versus like putting all that, like the force theme has been 
used a lot since then. And so it wasn't a meme yet at the time. Right. Probably. Right. <laughs> but well, still. and it fits too. If you're not like dissecting it and looking, it's like, yeah. And it's great. I mean, that's the whole what you know again we're talking about efficient storytelling thematic sort of composition like this is so so good at conveying that thing and it's it's a very uplifting theme too which is so contrasty from what just came before it so we have the like i can't do anything i'm not you know i don't like the empire but i can't do anything about it to maybe you can the yeah. force can you know Take through the heaven. force we can make this yeah. happen and i think it, it's so great and we've got of course the strings and then but the force theme uh if you notice is also played on woodwinds here yeah and that connects it to the woodwinds we had at the start during over over leia's, leia's absolutely which it really again flows. we could have had a more triumphant brass sound which would also feel thematically appropriate but i like that it kind of again keeps it in that more tender subtle uh kind of more intellectual in internal space and, and i think it's yeah. a very good way to kind of grow this kind of character and grow into the adventure and the force theme is such like um it is one of those themes that starts out small and can really expand like it's very very expansive and it's at least for me definitely more about that hope that like spark of you know, possibility that mm -hmm. uh, of seeing a little bit beyond yourself rather than like the force as a fully formed big thing already. Right. Right. Yeah. And I think it's just, it, it, it's that building that coming together that we see thematically. And, and it's just so, um, I'm, I'm glad for that, especially cause we, when we think of star Wars, we think of Williams, we think of giant brass sections and, mm. So to s get down it, it's like, man, he's wheel wielding these tender like woodwinds and string sections very, very, very deftly. And I love it. Absolutely. Um, so Luke says, I can take you as far as Anchorhead. You can get a transport there to Mos Eisley or wherever you're going, which is funny because <laughs> it's like Ben's been on this planet for so long. And Luke's like, well, I could take you. Like, they're just casually talking about him leaving, <laughs> which is really funny. Um, and then Ben is like, you must do what you feel is right, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so snarky. His lines are all so, like, hilarious to me and great. Right. Yeah, no, and he delivers it just so, so beautifully. Yeah, I he's like, I won't pressure want. you, but, but you must do what you feel is right. Uh-huh. Of and course. it's like, well, and it's kind of like he was watching, right? He's watching Luke. Like, what are you going to do? He's like, you must do what's right. You know what's yeah. right. Come on. <laughs> like, it's so great. Yeah. <laughs> but alas, um, we cut to an exterior shot of space and we hear the mm -hmm. Death Star little motif like, do, 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 do. And we see a Star Destroyer heading toward um, the, the Death Star. What we uh, know to be the Death Star. Interesting. Leading into that, though, is this like string, like like little like bloop, sweep oh, yeah, up, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is like a sonic screen wipe, right? As we get a literal screen wipe. That's and a that great way to put me. it. It's happened. I, oh, that's a good way to put it. It's come up a few. It's come up like a few times before this part of the movie. It's like something he does a lot in this movie, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's just like a weird little stinger, and it's it's just like oh, that's a good way to put it surprised me to hear it because i don't you know again just casually watching it you just kind of ignore it. like it you you hear it but you don't really focus on it and it's like this little like whoop we're screen wiping to new thing and then boom yeah so you're talking about the where it's like do 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 or it's kind of like almost chromatic -y at the end but it's like basically an ascending yeah. it's simple ascending like, little yeah sweet. and you said it's strings and sometimes they do I, it in winds i think it's strings it might be winds i can't remember but either way, it kind of goes up high. Yeah. Um, that is very interesting. I'm going to be keeping an ear out for that more because mm -hmm. it's like when it happens once, like the first time it happened, I was associating it with what I was seeing, which was like droid stuff happening. And I think, 
And then the next, or, or maybe it was after I Want You Alive. For some reason, that's like seared in my memory. I think it was, yeah, I think it was from, from there. Uh, bring me those, pl- uh, something, I want them alive or something like that. I don't know. I could be wrong. But with each subsequent time, it, it kind of shifts around what I'm associating with it. And there isn't like a clear, either other than like, I, it is kind of empire, Im- imperial. It really is like what you said, like a sonic screen wipe. Yeah. yeah. It's a nice little uh, stinger. It's a nice little transition, mm-hmm. transitional. And then we um, transition into the Death Star. Yeah. And so here we have no music for a couple minutes. Um, yeah. No music, just the conference room of the Death Star <laughs> with all the ambiance in the background. Mm-hmm. You get that low rumble, uh, which is just great, just kind of constant throughout. I, I love, love, love the choice to have no music here. I think it it lets because and this is what, what the thing I was talking about with I think if this were a more modern movie it, this would have been a scene that was just constant music because mm. um, that's I feel like a more modern aesthetic is to have a lot more music throughout but I love it and I especially love this is the uh, the force choke scene oh yeah and which we get that like choking noise it's all like guttural it gives me a vis- just... visceral reaction where it makes me gag <laughs> me like... too <laughs> and i think yeah you basically in that scene you have you have choking you have low rumble you have you know james earl jones voice and you get the choking and the mask uh darth vader's mask breathing and mm-hmm. i feel like just that all together it's just very it conveys the ominous it conveys kind of the the starkness of the empire and and we just let it ride we don't need the music to kind of force the emotional core of it we see it we 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 hear it we experience that choking kind of viscerally and i i just think it fits so well and i really really appreciate when composers use uh silence like that in in the score like those those moments of just kind of letting you sit with it. And it's something I try to do when I'm, when I'm working with film is to really pay attention to, you know, does this scene actually need music? Does it, is it going to add anything? And I think this is one of those great choices where the answer is like, no, we, we can actually convey everything we need to without the music. I'm so curious how looped in John Williams was to the sound design progress at the time. Because this is like Ben Burt's time to shine is like this Mm -hmm. or like the sound design's time to shine is here. Um, I'm very, I'm, I am really curious um, since it was the first film, like Mm -hmm. how looped in everyone was, I I would guess probably like definitely not as much as they are now, obviously. Right. Um, Right. With everything shared and everything's digital, we can just fly around with the kind of mixes as they're coming to life. Yeah. I, it's it's great sound design. Oh my god! And I will say that like the newer movies, or like Star Wars. See, it's because it's tough. Like trying to keep something, trying to keep a franchise. I really hate calling it a franchise, but it's a franchise now. <laughs> it's a franchise. Um, a franchise moving within its. Um, but keeping some of the spirit of what it started out as. And Mm -hmm. I think the sound designers of Star Wars have really um, been very considerate and um, taken a lot of care. And and, and there are like people on the, like there is, um, you know, there are people on this, on the sound design and I'm mixing and whatever. And of course it helps that John Williams has been the composer for all nine films. Um, Mm -hmm. But there always is like some sort of an ambiance on like the ships and the Imperials or the first order or whatever. They always have like a unique signature sound. That's not Mm -hmm. necessarily like the music, but that's like a sound design thing, like an ambiance. Um, yeah, because on the podcast we were doing Last Jedi last season, and it was also an, a thing that, you know, even though it was decades after this film, it definitely did have, um, like, there definitely was a First Order sound uh, that I kept noticing. And mm-hmm. here, Ben Burt 
um, in interviews, he has talked about the design of the Death Star sounds, and he has said in interviews, um, you're pretty much always hearing a low rumble, and sometimes you hear a rhythmic pounding, kind of like a big heartbeat. Gives the station a feeling of being alive and very powerful. And I've also like that's, that's heard them talk about like how um, the sound of the Death Star is like, it's always it always sounds like something's happening on there. It's not like a static sound. Like Mm -hmm. it's not like a, a clear, yeah, it's, there's a lot of like random peaks and and like random rumbles, like random things turning on that kind of gives you the sense of like, this is a really big thing. Some test is happening in this room over here. Like it, there's just, it's just hustling and bustling. It's like Mm -hmm. very much a working, it's a very operational, (laughs) um, It's one of those things where, so, uh, I worked for a while in a very, very large space observatory working on very large telescopes and it's inside of it is very industrial and closed in like there's like no windows and stuff. And it's, it was kind of remote as on top of a volcano and, what? It kind of has similar sound. Yeah, I've I've done a lot of weird things in my life. Um, Wait, where was this? It was on the island of Maui, uh, Hawaii. What was the observatory called? Uh, it was the uh, uh, was what was it called? The it was on top of Haleakala uh, volcano. Okay. It was it wasn't the Mauna Kea one, which is the more famous one. Um, so <laughs> funny so, you mentioned but, that. Yeah. Yeah, it's got like this low, it always has these rumbles. There's always like pipes pushing like water around. There's like all these machines, pumps and, and various things. That's so things. scary. It's weird. And and it kind of, it was what I imagined like being on an oil rig would be like or something. Totally. And so when, when I see this like Star Wars thing, I think back to those like that the scene where you're on the Death Star, it's this very mechanical, very built environment with a lot happening and there's always some background rumble and, and it does have a noise to it. Um, your environment, your, your place to root you in that sense of place. I did not know places like that existed. However, Ben Burt has also said, which it's very <gasps> funny that you mentioned that he said a lot of the doors, the clattering and banging were recorded at Mount Palomar, Palomar observatory. Mount Palomar Literally, Observatory. yeah. So you, that is, he recorded the big motors um, that rotate the telescope and the shutters that open and close the dome. Um, oh he says gosh. it was in a huge echoey space. A lot of the recordings yep. from Mount Palomar ended up being incidental mechanical sounds on the Death Star, like things opening and closing. So basically, yep. what you said is like actually what it is, like Perfect. what he did. <laughs> it, it's and it makes total sense because yeah, like you huge must, open spaces, motors. It's um, funny how wow. like it, yeah, it must not have been like even that manipulated um it it just if it it's it's amazing because like sound design um is like it's ben, ben bird is like so literal yeah. with it sometimes yeah. like goes straight to sources like it's not like too much or it's not like starts on a computer and ends on a computer just completely mm-hmm. like synthesis like just like i don't know modular synthesis or, or whatever it's like sample right. he's like samples stuff that's so cool. A lot. Because like so so often you get, you know, sound design that's like, okay, I layered this like weird digital noise with this yeah. dolphin screaming and, and the sound of a too, hurricane. But it just, the part that separates him, or he's like an old school sound designer, is that like it always starts with like the sound of a dolphin or like with something that exists yeah. in, real, in real life where he's like, oh, I heard this sound or it's like the project, I've heard, I know, I've heard this projector sound, like that would be you know, oh, I know this other sound, like, oh, yeah, there this observatory sound. Yeah, that like, mm-hmm. he has, yeah, he places it in very, like, specific <sighs> locations. I think that's, it makes it, um, it makes it feel, like, so real. Tangible is it, the word I want. Tangible, to yeah. Because sometimes it's hard to, like, manufacture from scratch the depth of yeah. a sound. Absolutely. I completely agree. That's very cool. Um, another Ben Burt note is that, um, a lot of the ambient, like electronic sounds that you hear in the background, the telemetry Uh 
which wow. I had to look up what telemetry meant. Um, telemetry is, according to Wikipedia, it is the in, in, in situ, 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 spelled like the beginning of situation, but I don't know. Okay. Um, collection of measurements or other data at remote points and their automatic transi- transmission to receiving equipment, telecommunication for monitoring. Um, the word is derived from the Greek roots tele, remote, and metron, meter, or sorry, measure. Um, so a lot of those, you know, like beep, 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 mm-hmm. <laughs> sounds. Love it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, they come from recordings he made off of an old shortwave radio, which I, to be honest, I'm not exactly sure what a shortwave radio is, but his grandfather had one and it was built in the 1930s. Oh my gosh. And Ben Burt says in interviews it seemed as though it received sound that nobody else could get (laughs) (laughs) i used to dial around and be fascinated by all the electronic noise and signals that seemed to be coming from space or somewhere in the atmosphere he had recorded some of the shortwave sounds as a teenager and saved the tapes and then when it came to developing the ambiance of star wars he went back through those shortwave radio tapes and pulled snippets of sounds here and there Ran it at different Gosh. speeds, put it through echo chambers. And um, yeah, he says that he had a lot of fun building those telemetry backgrounds. And so a lot of those just random random ambient beeps and like transmission stuff happening and whatever is just like random samples from that shortwave radio that he recorded when he was a teenager. That's so cool. It's funny. Yeah. <laughs> Love Ben Burt. Okay. So... Here, the conversation, they're talking about how the battle station is fully operational. Um, but um, Commander Tag says, until this battle, oh, until the battle station is fully operational, so it's not yet, we are vulnerable. The Rebel Alliance is too well equipped. They're more dangerous than you realize, which in retrospect is like funny to hear them say, because mm-hmm. I was so, like, it's all a matter of perspective. They're not nearly as well equipped as the Empire is, or maybe the Empire is like putting on a big facade. Who knows? Um, Admiral Mati says, dangerous to your Starfleet commander, not to this battle station. Um, and then they kind of go back and forth. The rebellion will continue to gain support in the Imperial Senate. And then Tarkin, the Imperial Senate will no longer be of any concern to us. I have just received word that the emperor has dissolved the council permanently. The last remnants of the old Republic have been swept away, which is so sad. Um, so sad. (laughs) Very sad. Um, to, knowing from reading like the Princess Leia books. Mm-hmm. Anyway, um, that's impossible. How will the emperor maintain control without the bureaucracy? Um, the regional governors now have direct control over their territories. Fear will keep the local systems in line. Fear of this battle station. What basically this con- conversation continues for a while. And it, whenever I'm watching the movie, um, for some reason, the actual words kind of gloss over my head. <laughs> well, I think it's funny that they talk again. We could have had a great, it's like a perfect moment to have like the fear of the battle station, dun, 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 you know, like a big brassy moment here. And we just don't. And I think that that actually makes it more frightening because you just like fear of the battle station, low hum. It's like we're in it. We don't need to play Absolutely. up with an emotional cue we can just let the side of diegetic sounds like and and the way we talk about it convey everything we need to convey and i think that that actually heightens the scariness of of the death star i mean it is very scary and everything else working in the scene like the like the visual design of it is you know very stark and mm-hmm. um you know their costumes the way that they're acting clearly you know they're not like they're sitting, you know, very, they're all very attentive. Like it is very, you know, a very stiff atmosphere, um, right. stiff and formal and stench of fear, like in the air. And Tarkin is just like no hint of, no hint of joy on his face. No hint of, no, nope. no hint of smile, which is, you know, it's fine. But Tarkin is very like, um, you know, he's Tarkin. Um <laughs> He is very, um, it sounds like it seems in the scene that he's like running the ship, Mm -hmm. which is 
also interesting to me, like in retrospect, because Vader is like supposed to be the big, the big bad, I guess. Mm-hmm. But Tarkin is the one that's like, enough of this Vader, release him yeah. as you wish. Like that, that's like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, that, is, that was fascinating. And it really conveys the power dynamics. And it does convey like Vader as this sort of scary, almost solo, like force adjacent to like the Empire is really interesting because it's not just him as the like he's very obviously oh the big bad he's got the costume he's got the voice he's got the breathing but it also I think then again separates like it's him and the Empire as a whole is is a big bad and and it's like these two entities together yeah and you know to me I never found Vader to be that scary <laughs> and I don't know it may be it might be like a prequel generation thing it might be you know not seeing like I had seen Return of the Jedi before I had seen Star Wars like A New Hope it's like I already knew going into the whole Star Wars journey like I already know how it, where it goes I already know that like uh-huh. Vader ends up redeeming if, like I so it almost felt like um, seeing Vader in this film for me as a kid was sort of like, oh, well, this is before he turns good. And mm-hmm. so um, that maybe ruined it for me. But also, I think that Vader, I think villains are maybe like written differently in this film. Or maybe it's an era thing. You know, yeah. Vader strikes me here like as being associated with like the wrong side or whatever. But so far Vader has more in common with like Obi-Wan than anyone else here. He's like a kooky force person, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it is interesting to see these two scenes just like right back to back where we have Obi-Wan talking about like, you got to learn the force. It's, it's the way. And then like, yeah, like we're going to rule this universe through the force because that's the thing. And everyone's just kind of putting up with him. And Vader doesn't even like <laughs> super know what's up. Like he is there to just be silent and intimidate. Like he's there to just yeah. be intimidating and to fork choke people and to say stuff like, I mean, the most <laughs> he has said is like at the beginning where he's like, I knew those plans and like blah, blah, blah. Like he says some stuff, but it's really Tarkin. It's like really the other officers that are doing the actual stuff, which makes sense. Cause right. you know, officers, you know, Vader is kind of a higher rank. He's more, more big picture. But I think I, I, I personally think Vader is like so big picture that he, he doesn't even like super care. I don't, I don't think Vader yeah. really cares. I don't. Yeah. I think he's just there. You know, he, he, he doesn't even really care that much about the Death Star. He's like, it's inconsequential to the power of the, you know, like, <laughs> right? it's like the most powerful really in weapon this. <laughs> in the- but it does elevate sort of the force and, and to see those two contrasting sides, which is, which is cool. It but does, yeah, it's just it does elevate like the force. It ele- but it, I, I think it's like, I also love the juxtaposition. I love how like Vader is kind of the force um, evangelical or whatever, force evangelizer on the dark side here or the empire. Mm-hmm. And Ben is also that, but on the light side and um, how, they have so much in common in that they're peers and by peers, I, I mean like Aunt yeah, Baru and uncle Owen, they're like, Oh, Ben's that crazy guy. Um, they have this, something about them is like off on a different plane. And at this point I'm thinking like, if I'm watching this for the first time, like either it elevates the force to a different place. I'm not sure yet if it's a good place. It might be like a mutually weird place because the force is like, here's the thing like that I think is actually really important to the nature of the force itself is that the force is not associated just with the light side not and just the rebels. The force is like everywhere. It's not right. like just Luke here. It's Luke and Vader and, and you know, Obi-Wan and Vader and, um, yeah, so I th- I guess what I'm trying to say is like you can't walk away from these Vader scenes where Vader is being like the Force person and go like, oh, the Force is only for the good guys. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. And I think if I were to add a music cue in here, I think when Vader starts talking about the Force, throwing in a bit of a Force theme, but like mangled in some way or reversed or or uh, put into a minor key or something to kind of be like, it's the same thing we've been talking mm-hmm. about with Obi-Wan, but ominous. Like would be a potential way to go. And I think that could be an effective thing. Although maybe the force theme isn't about the force. Maybe it's about what we were talking about where it's like the hope Mm -hmm. that you, it's the hopeful part of the force. It's the part, it's the part of the force. It's like what you see in the force and it's not the power of the force. Right. It's like how it can, yeah. I love how, Which like, I, again, is why it's so brilliant that it it could have been that, but it's, a, but it's such didn't. a good choice to just have it not. Yeah, I think there's so much restraint in these scores. Like, in, in, mm-hmm. in this score, there's definitely, I, I feel like there's a lot of restraint. And here, I also like that there's not, like, Vader theme or, like, something like that, yeah. like, too. Because yeah. that would have, I don't know. I think this humanizes Vader. Like, it makes Vader a different kind of villain or like a Mm -hmm. like Vader's different put it this way Vader's different and I I feel like I actually feel like Vader is pretty in line with like Anakin Skywalker the Anakin we know from the prequels who also Mm -hmm. I will maintain did not know crap about politics and didn't really care (laughs) he just wanted to like do his thing yeah and he would kind of fit in and like his conversations that he ever had about politics were like he could change his mind if like you needed him to, or if like, he didn't really think too critically about it. He right. just was like, well, why don't we do this? Oh, we should make them. But, uh, Oh, but like, I don't know. Just he, that's not his thing. His thing is using the force. And well, this is a little bit of a tangent, but I actually think like, I think about Vader's well being a lot <laughs> in my <laughs> daily life. <laughs> like I constantly kind of think like, like it keeps me up at night sometimes where I'm like, I wonder what sort of joy or I wonder like what Vader's life was like when yeah. he was Vader. Like, I hope he's doing okay. <laughs> and like, while I don't condone the actions that he carries out under the empire, I, I think of Vader as in a way, someone who is, how do I put this? Bound to the emperor in a really Stockholm syndrome-y, like, in a really messed up, like, um, dependent way. Like, he has forced Mm. dependency on him in the Uh way, like, basically, I I see him as as almost like a a parable, like a, um, like, I see Vader as a disabled person. Hmm. who relies on the emperor for his life support, basically. And he can't live without the suit is just canon. Like, that's just, he can't live without the suit. And who built this, like, who rescued, like, the person who rescued him from um, Mustafar when he was, like, about to die and built the suit and maintains the suit because also Vader, like, Vader has multiple suits. Like, they don't show it in the movies, but but it's it's in books. In, um where like he has multiple suits and like he has to like change out of them and they have to be like, like the suit is vital to his survival. He has to have the suit. Yeah. And yeah. so he will travel with like backup suits and stuff. And like he needs the suit. The empire maintains that. That's his like healthcare, you know, mm-hmm. like he, yeah. even if he wanted to be like, you know what, screw this. Like I'm going to go look for my kids. Like, Right. Like I mean he is literally disabled and, and dependent upon Exactly. Him. Now now I'm just picturing the em- emperor driving around with like a Darth Vader helmet sticker and it just says who rescued who. Oh my god. <laughs> oh another thing I think about is like how they could have probably like I bet the emperor could have made I bet in the decades that transpired between episode 3 and episode 4, you know, Anakin being like young and Vader being you know, I don't know how old he is now. I have to do the math. Like in this 50s, okay. Um, the technology and the resources of the empire have grown since then, but his suit has not changed really. Mm-hmm. Like 
they couldn't have updated his like i'm sure they could have fig- i'm sure they could have figured out a way to make vader less dependent on the suit and on the emperor but that's not in the emperor's best interest and i i it just makes me think <laughs> okay i like this interpretation <laughs> so that's that's my piece um <laughs> <laughs> but I do think about it quite a bit. So um, don't be too proud of this technological terror you've constructed. The ability to destroy a planet is insignificant next to the power of the force. Um, don't try to frighten us with your sorcerer's ways, Lord Vader. Your sad devotion to that ancient religion hasn't helped you conjure up the stolen data tapes or given you clairvoyance enough to find the rebels hidden fortress. And then that's when he starts to joke. Mm-hmm. And it's weird to think how much of this was done in ADR. Yeah. I wonder if the choking was. Probably. I noticed the ADR on the next scene, but. Oh, like, okay. Well, I, we're about to get there, right? You mean that scene? There. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I didn't. I mean, I guess I'm so used to it. Like, I guess it wouldn't. I don't know how much of it was ADR, the scene, but it seems like could easily be a lot, if not most of it. I think what stood out to me is like how compressed, and, and this isn't necessarily an ADR thing, but um, the recording quality of the film is different. And there are so many different versions that, I mean, it would be impossible to yeah talk about all of them, but at least the recording that we were using for this episode um, I don't know. I feel like there's pretty strong compression happening on yeah, the dialogue. Yeah. Um, well, and of course, all of Vader is ADR too, because oh, yeah. James Earl Jones came in later. For sure, for so. sure. So anyway, then we cut back to Tatooine. Mm-hmm. The speeder stops, um, and then we see the remains of a huge sand crawler. Yeah, and we get the uh, uh, brass now comes into this. Uh, brass and strings. The bass melody is in a nice legato, and you probably have it. No, keep keep keep, okay. keep telling us about uh, it. Which is which is you know gives it a nice. It starts out a little bit tender, but it kind of builds into much more of an uh, an ominous oh, thing. I know what you're talking about now. It starts with a solo. Yeah, I think it's like a solo trumpet, probably. Um, de, de, de. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think okay. That's it. Uh, and, and it builds, and I think it's it's really great because uh, I, I don't know. I, I like, yeah, it takes about 20 seconds for it to kind of the strings to start swelling in. And over the top, we have Obi-Wan um, talking about how it looks like, right? This is one where it's like, I think it, or it's meant to look like a sand people attack or something mm. like that. Um, and then... I love the part too, where as soon as Obi Wan's like, it's made to look like that, but he starts talking about how it's the Imperial stormtroopers, and as soon as he starts to mention that it's Imperial, the horns, as everything's been getting bigger, now we have these big horns that are like bum bum bum, uh, and you get that rhythmic horns. Up until now, it's been mostly legato, mostly slow, mostly like sort of long held things, but then we start getting that rhythmic, and. I just I love that build up to to, you know, the Empire and the Imperial Stormtroopers, these elite units. And I think that just kind of the, the, the flow of that scene musically is just is is great. This is another one that sort of opens up like with this, like it starts with the solo trumpet. And then it's like as the realizations like keep piling on, it grows into you know, it, it sort of mirrors like Luke's mind here as he's discovering new things. Also, it's like such fantastic world building in this do- in this exchange, which is about, you know, what this is. We learn also about sand people. We also learn about like Jawas, like we learn about hiding mm-hmm. their tracks. Like we just get a lot of like information for free just about this yeah. world. Yeah. And it's it's done in such an emotional way too. I, I feel like because you're looking at this and you're you're seeing this devastation, and it feels so, you know, like stuff just keeps happening. Excuse me. And and it's it's kind of that, you know, after sort of Luke refused the the call, it's just like stuff's happening now, and he can't get away from it. 
Uh, he's trying to walk away, but it's obviously it's affecting him directly now or starting to dun dun dun. Yeah. So the opening, the, the trumpet part, it reminds me of um, the opening of pictures at an exhibition. Um, yes. The first movement promenade, I think it's called. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think that's on purpose. I just, it just <laughs> reminds every time I hear it, I'm like, do, 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 do. Oh wait, no. It kind of does, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. It's it's like impossible to separate that kind of solo trumpet in that range. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. It's yeah, it's just, it's a particular range. I think that's what it is. I mean, and of, well, also the intervals are like this. Like it is the first few notes are the same, but mm-hmm. and um, because we're both you know composer music people, we'll just go ahead and say that Williams was borrowing from Ravel's rendition there, and we're talking about the sand people walking, and and the, the jaw was walking in twos, and the promenade is about walking. So it's totally. <laughs> maybe maybe Although, these are the hot takes you come here for the star wars music minute <laughs> that's a good or well i mean i think you were kidding but like <laughs> also i forget sometimes that like pictures at an exhibition which is a very famous piece by mazorgsky it actually mm-hmm. was originally a piano piece yep and solo piano so when i say like the trumpet part i'm talking about Ravel's orchestration of mm-hmm. pictures at an exhibition and a lot of like the fame like when people talk about things that are borrowed from pictures at an exhibition or remind them of pictures at an exhibition which happens a lot like it's a very like it's a very famous piece of music and yeah. I think it's really awesome I think it's very fun to play it's amazing yeah wonderful usually piece we're talking to... like nine like 9.5 times out of 10 <laughs> We're talking about Ravel's orchestration of yeah. it because that's the like most popularized form of it. So but like, it is interesting yeah. that Ravel chose trumpet for most of the the promenade walking parts. Uh, I don't know. It's interesting sonically to think about why why would when you're arranging something that was on piano, arranging it for an orchestra, choosing trumpet, choosing that kind of solo trumpet like that. Why would you do that? Why did Williams choose solo trumpet here? Mm. Oh. Mm. I wish I knew exactly what was temp tracked here. But it in any case, so the solo trumpet doesn't stay solo for very long. No. And we, it picks, start, it really starts picking up, I think. Yeah, it really only takes, I want to say like 15 seconds, 20 seconds for it to really start solo and then get into this more ensemble um, ominous and then the horn chords start start hitting more brass chords so it, it again very very efficient that we can go from from a solo like I, I in my notes i said it almost starts off tender uh and it's like tender yeah. for like a measure before it starts to feel ominous and i think that's just so efficient because we get like it's kind of tragic what happened to to this thing and but it's also scary. And I think that is just such efficient use of compositional space. Totally. And as the um, intensity or as the like fear, as the, you know, bad, as the, I don't know, as the things crash down, <laughs> I should not use idioms ever. Um, <laughs> as as things you start, to, start to unveil for Luke and, you know, you can mm-hmm. like his heart starts racing more um, or, you know, he starts picking yeah. up the pace more like he gets more agitated, like physically. The tempo picks he's, up. Yeah, the tempo picks up. He's like running toward the land speeder and we get the like strings come in with the, you know, the eighth notes. Do, 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 do. Um, which is a very like strikes me as a very like Williams esque type of Mm -hmm. action danger cue. I don't really know if it's, I haven't seen it cataloged in Frank Lehman's complete catalog of the musical themes of star Wars, but it very well might be in there. (laughs) Just, yeah. Um, but he kind of does a lot of that type of stuff where it's like stepwise, but going down to the same note where it's like, types yeah. of things like even it's in like other like movies yeah yeah exactly like sometimes it's like like um and yeah he he uses that here 
And well, and if we want to talk about why pedals are so effective too, oh, if we relate it back to the previous scene where the the low rumble of the Death Star is basically a pedal tone the whole time. So even though you picked it up, you've got this pace, you've got this very rhythmic motion, the fact that it's kind of hitting a singular note often is used for foreboding stuff, often, you know, these types of drone type things. It's not a drone, but it is kind of hitting that pedalish thing. Yeah. I realize I probably should have explained pedal earlier. It's just like, it comes up very, it comes up frequently. Um, so sorry listeners, if I haven't explained pedal this season, but, um, I know that we definitely talked about it in episode six, um, the binary sunset breakdown a little bit. I mean, it's just, it's not something we talked about. It's just a reference thing. So like just a quick little pedal well when people talk about pedal tones or like pedal in music like literally it's spelled like bicycle pedal um it refers to a sustained single pitch that is remaining unchanged while other stuff happens on top of it and it come and it's called that because it refers back to like organs which have um you know, they look like a piano on top and they look like a bunch of foot pedals on the bottom, basically. Mm -hmm. And um, the part that the foot, that the feet play are the pedals. Like, so when you play an organ, you will press pedals with your feet. I mean, it's a very like, it's a very athletic instrument to play, <laughs> to be honest. It really is. It's, it's pretty incredible. But yeah, when you, when you hear organs or when you like, you play an organ, you'll often like press something with your feet. And it'll kind of the pedal tone, like literally the pedal, the pipe that you're and it's often like a low note, um, mm -hmm. will stay there for a while. And you can just like play stuff on top. Um, mm -hmm. And Another, then you switch the pedal sometimes and like, mm -hmm. yeah. So in Another music, a common thing, yeah, is to have like a piano just like hammering on a low note, a very like boom, boom. And it's just constantly throughout where your chords around it change, but it, it gives like a very steady thing with like, like that everything else is kind of in relation to musically. Um, and it's very, 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 very common, common in, in like contemporary film scores, very, very common to yeah. have like an ostinato on top with pedal, with changing pedal points on the bottom. Yep. So it kind of gives it a sense of movement, but it's more of an accordal sense. It's not really like a melody. It's not really like a theme. It's more like a vibe that is changing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's a little bit, well, like, 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 like just the changing, like, I don't mm -hmm. know. That was probably a bad example, but the point is like the, the, <laughs> that was kind of a bad example, but anyway, the point right. is like a, something solid. So here, when we're saying that the, this note, because it keeps going down to here. Mm -hmm. She was saying like that it was kind of like almost like a pedal, even though it's not being sustained necessarily. You can imagine that it's something like. So it's functioning kind yeah. of like a pedal. So Good point, I Elizabeth. <laughs> I call it, I, I, I'm going to say that good was. Pedal point. You know, good, good pedal point. Good pedal point. I love it. Oh my God. That's a pun. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I also think uh, one thing I also want to bring up too that struck me as interesting in the sound design is, is as soon as like Luke goes to run off to his speeder and you actually see the speeder, it, you hear it and it's like, this has been on the whole time, <laughs> but you haven't heard it until it's visually point. on screen. And I is thought it that was kind of funny. I, no, I think it's just like right on the cut. You hear it. It's just like uh -huh. right there. And it's just funny. It's like, wait, where's that then? Um, but of course, you don't really need to hear it if you're not seeing it. And I think it's one of those moments that when you're meticulously breaking something down, you hear it. And it sounds kind of funny because you're like, well, in reality, that would have been going the whole time and the camera would have been right next to it, like position wise. So why weren't we hearing it? But it totally would not have were, like made sense to hear it before then. Uh, yeah. So those are like the funny little things. It's kind of like when in animation, when you see like the smear frame, at, like as a still, and it just looks really weird. But in context, it's fine. 
It's like what's a smear frame? Oh, that's why I like those like frames where you see like six of their arms because they're in like motion oh, or like okay. their like body's really weird and like think like old Looney Tunes. Oh, okay. Um, it, it's like if you look at the singular frame of it, it just doesn't make sense at all. It looks so bizarre. But in context, it gives it that motion. It gives it that extra thing. And I don't know. I think of it like that. It's like in it when you're focusing on some moment, we're like the sound starts here. It's like, that's weird. But in context, you're not thinking about that. You're like, oh, God, it's a speeder. It's already running. He's he's getting away, you know, or he, he's running away. He has to go back home. And it, it gives it that that feel like the speeder is a real thing. It's really there. It's something that people use to get around. So uh, it's a great sound, kind of just, too. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's fun. So good. Um, I think. This is a good time to transition to the Star Wars Music Minute questionnaire. Are you ready? I love it. I, I, I'm i ready. All right. So Star Wars Music Minute questionnaire is the same three questions that I ask every guest. And they're sort of lightning round questions. Um, question number one. In exactly three words, what does Star Wars sound like? Um, for me, uh, John fucking Williams. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Okay. I love it. Love it. Um, that's my one, my one swear this whole that's episode. Amazing. Okay. Um, number two, what is something related to star Wars music or sound that you would like to learn more about? Um, we didn't really get to talk much about droids here, which is a little sad because <laughs> obviously droids are like droids. the heart and soul of star Wars. Uh, it's, C three PO, right? And and I would love to know more about how, like, the very very specific specifics of how they mix C three PO's voice, um, mm. because he's such a character throughout the whole series, and uh, he's got a very I feel like distinct voice. And I would just love to know like what effects units did they put on it? What what did it sound like raw? Like even the microphones and stuff. I think would have been great to know and. This is like the mu- the the production mixer person in me, but I think it would be really really fun to just do like a super detailed deep dive on C three PO's voice. I feel that way about many topics, and I know I mean, that there's yeah. like a lot of information out there about how things were made. But like so often, I want to know exactly. Like sometimes I'm like, is this a comb filter? Is this like a? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I'm such like, a nerd. I want to know like stuff. where's I the filter it. on this or like yeah. Yeah, I think about that a lot. With, I think is. about that a lot with droids' voices in particular. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. And I have, I have tweeted one of the sound designers on Star Wars before and they were like, we're not, we can't say, (laughs) but, um, yes, that would be great to know that. Um, so, and the final question is what is a score or soundtrack that you're fond of besides anything Star Wars? Um, I really, uh, have been loving, uh, uh, Hilder Guna daughter. Um, she did the soundtrack to Chernobyl, and which was the HBO miniseries about Chernobyl. Uh, very, I love what she's doing with that, and I want to hear so much more. She also did Joker soundtrack, uh, but her score for Chernobyl, I think, is just uh, talk about complete opposite to John Williams, where it's a much more textural score. She has a lot of the sounds from um, actual nuclear power plants in it and you're saying hers is more textural yeah hers is much more textural whereas john williams is very thematic uh uh her scores tend to blur a lot of the lines between sound design and music uh and i i love it and i think she's just really one of the most brilliant composers in soundtracks right now um so i can't can't wait to hear more but yes chernobyl is a great great miniseries and it's a great uh great score so that's awesome. Um, the musical themes that were in this set of minutes were Leia, The Force, and Death Star. And if you're following along on the soundtrack, this corresponds to, depending on which soundtrack you own, they have different names. Um, uh, what's one of them called? Tales of a... No, not Tales. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. Tales of a Jedi Knight slash Learn About the Force. Um, also, toward the end, The Return Home and burning homestead so 
you might see one or all of those titles on whichever version of the soundtrack you have, whichever of the 50,000 versions of the soundtrack you have. Um, yeah. So, Elizabeth, where can people find you online? Uh, best place to find my music is elizabethlane.bandcamp.com. I'm just going to send you right there. I have a few, if you like sort of orchestrally soundtrack style music. That's... I have also played on one of her tracks. Yes. Xanthi uh, and, and hopefully coming in my third album. Hopefully I'll get you on that one too. So there's uh, try to collaborate with amazing people. And of course, Xanthi's amazing. So go check it out. And you can find me on Twitter. I'm lizard eats flies. All one word. Uh, come say hi. Awesome. And you can find Star Wars Music Minute on YouTube as the same episodes on YouTube as are on the podcast feed. So if you're listening to one and prefer the other, just know that that is an option. Um, social media wise, I'm on TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, all of them at Star Wars Music Minute or at Twitter on Twitter at Star Wars Musemen. And you can also find me at Chrysanthi Tan on all of the platforms. Additionally, this is new. <laughs> You can leave me a message, a voice message, a question or something, or you can just make a sound. You can leave a message in character if you want, in Star Wars character or not. Um, anyway, you can go to starwarsmusicminute.com slash comlink. By the time this episode comes out, that will be set up. Um, so, yeah, feel free to do that. Um, Send Xanthi your best droid noises. That would be great. Um, and select recordings that people send depending on like how many i get um i will pepper episodes with them i might start a couple episodes with them someone has already sent me a message um in character and it was great so do that starwarsmusicminute.com slash comlink as always if you want to know more about the musical themes of Star Wars, you can check out Frank Lehman's complete catalog of the themes of Star Wars. And if you like this sort of format, you can check out other Movies by Minutes podcasts, including the inspiration for this show, um, Star Wars Minute, which breaks down the movies, the Star Wars movies, one minute at a time, not from a musical perspective, but from a perspective. And I have a lot of guest episodes on their podcast as well. So, yes, Thank you for listening and I'll see you next week for a deep dive on DS Irae from a DS Irae guru <laughs> and myself. So anyway, may the force be with you. Oh, I'm sounding like a droid now. Oh, 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 oh